times where I cast prayed for people that were possessed and they cast out demons. I was I was uh, praying for the sick and they're getting healed. Even just worshiping, even just worshiping God. Let's give it up for Andrew too. Andrew gave us some awesome worship this morning. Anointed. Right, he was able to come up here and, and perform and, and worship the Lord. And, and the thing about being baptized in the Holy Spirit and filled with the Holy Spirit, He gives you an anointing to do anything. And, and there's power behind it. It's more than just, hey, I'm up here giving you guys a lecture about Jesus. I'm, I'm giving you a presentation like you're in school. Uh, I'm, I'm preaching in a way and the Holy Spirit just flowing out. And people that are filled with the Holy Spirit and baptized in the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter what they do, there's power behind their words. If they're singing, right, there's, there's, a, there's a Christian music station out there that's all like anti-Holy Spirit, you know, more of a Baptist feel. Uh, they're singing these songs that were created by like Jesus culture and these Holy Spirit filled songs. And then they're going to have some Baptist singers cover it. And it sounds great, but it doesn't have that same power behind it, that same anointing that, that, that comes through the music. The church needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And in the Assemblies of God, one of the things we believe is that one of the evidences that you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit is you speak in tongues. And I know that sounds weird, like, why do I got to speak in tongues? Right? <clears throat> I know James says if you have control over your tongue, uh, perfection has come. The tongue is one thing that, that no man can control. But when you surrender your life to Christ, when you say, God, I'm willing to be used by you, he, he takes control over the thing that you can't control. Is your tongue. So, man, I get fired up about the Holy Spirit. I, I got filled, overflowing. I've seen so many miracles take place. And then even in worship, you're... you're your awareness of God's presence is, is enhanced. Like you can sense his presence on like a whole other level. He's in you. He's around you. And, and he's just pouring out of you. Amen. So I want to I get into our message today. The message title is Taking Territory. Like let's take some territory, y'all. Let's get filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's take territory. And you've received power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. How many here is like, hey, I've been filled with the Holy Spirit. I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, right? So since you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, have you taken territory? Have you made disciples? Are you afraid of the enemy? Are you focused on what the enemy is doing all the time, but you're not seeing what God is doing in your life? A lot of times we just magnify, oh, it's so dark, the enemy's doing this, it's so discouraging, and we don't look at how great our God is. This is the greatest time in the world to live, right? Like, it's a beautiful time to live right now, and also we have a God that is just incredible. He's big, he's bigger than any problem you're facing. When we focus on what the enemy's doing all the time, we're missing out on how incredible God is. Are, you cha are your challenges bigger than your view of God? That's what I'm saying. We, we experience challenges. I experience challenges. We all experience something. But what's going to be greater? Our view of God or what the challenge is? I know there was a moment in life where where David uh, had to step up to a Goliath because everybody was afraid to be who God called him to be. There, there was just this, this uh, intimidation factor that flooded the whole nation that nobody wanted to step up to this Goliath because they were afraid. And David said, you know what, I've had some reps before. I, I took out a lion. I took out a bear. This Philistine giant is no different than that. That his view of what God can do in his life is greater than his challenges and his opposition. And Moses, we're talking about Moses now. Let's talk about Moses. Moses uh, has done incredible things. He's freed millions of people from slavery. They walk through the Red Sea. God split it open. They walked on dry ground. He's leading them out in the desert. 
God is providing manna. He's providing quail. He's providing something new. Right? They, they haven't experienced it before. They say, why can't we do it the old way? Why can't we have church the old way? Why can't we do it how we always done it? And God's like, I want something new for you, man. Like a lot of us get bored in the Christian faith because it's the same thing over and over again. But God wants to do something new in your life. The filling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You could be filled again and again and again and again. You don't have to use the filling that you had when you were a teenager. You can have the fresh filling today in this service today. He wants to pour new oil, fresh anointing in your life today. But we look at Moses. He's leading people. And this is what I love to see what Moses did. Moses was an incredible leader. He actually wasn't about him getting all the glory and just only about him. He said, you know what? Who can I bring along with me to rise, uh, to, to, to lead, to rise up in the ranks? And he invested so much time and energy in Joshua and Caleb. There's people that he, he was mentoring, just like how Jethro mentored Moses and discipled him. Now he's taking on some young leaders and discipling people. And check this out. He's giving opportunity to, to do ministry, to, to do things. A lot of times we complicate discipleship so much. And I'll probably, next time I speak, I'll talk more about this more in depth. But discipleship isn't super complicated. It's like take one person under your wing and show them what to do. And then allow them to do it. And then have a relationship where you can talk through what, what you've done and what you've seen. And how can we work through this? But people need opportunity. Like it's so cool to see Andrew up here worshiping the Lord. Like he had an opportunity to sing. <laughs> you know, and be able to worship. Um, you, you got to pray last week. And it was just an anointing prayer. Like it was just like you came up there and he's like, you're going to pray today. She's like, oh, but she just stepped to the occasion and prayed a powerful prayer last week that she had an opportunity to use the gifts and talents that God has put inside. That every single person here has gifts, talents and abilities to do great things. We need opportunity to be able to step out into that and, and be who God's called us to be. So Moses spent a lot of time to give opportunity to Joshua to grow into his leadership. So I ask you this, who is your apprentice? Who are you discipling today? What is their name? Right? You have somebody in your life that you're pouring into and making a disciple of Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't call us just to make converts. He called us to make disciples. Right? Who are we discipling? To, 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 to step into ministry, to follow Christ, to who are we developing under us? So I want to I want to read the scriptures here. <clears throat> this is Hebrews. Well, I mean numbers, sorry, numbers uh, 13, 25 through 33, if you have your Bibles. Numbers 13. It's a familiar story. It's the report of the spies. So verse 25, at the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron with all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh. And they brought back the words to all that were conjugated and showed them the fruit of the land. So let me just set this up real quick. Moses sent them out. He sent out 12 spies to, sp to, sp to spy out the promised land. That this land that, that God's told them that he's going to lead them to. He left his hometown, his home country. And he's just been on this faith journey. Uh, leading them out of Egypt into the promised land. And check this out. First, uh, so now they have the congregation there. They have everybody assembled Verse 27, it says, Then he told them, We came to the land which you sent us, and it flows with milk and honey, and it's fruit. Right? Like it's like the things that we heard about, the things God said, Hey, I'm going to lead you to a promised land flowing with milk and honey. Like they've seen it. 
They've seen the incredible things. And then they said, it's fruit. Like the fruit that they saw there was incredible. <clears throat> uh, one, one, uh, a few scriptures before, that they're like walking with these massive grapes. Right? They're, they're, they're carrying like these massive grapes back like on a, on a, a pole that t- t- like two people to carry the, all these, these massive fruits. It says, yes, it's flowing in milk and honey. Yes, God's doing awesome things there. But verse 28 says, however, the people who dwell in the land are strong. Their cities are fortified and are very large. Besides, we saw descendants of the Anak there. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites the dwell in the hill country. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the Jordan. Just a long list of, ah, you know, from beautiful fruits, flowing of milk and honey, just an incredible land. And then it's just like, now we're going to get this negative report. But Caleb, verse 30, Caleb quieted all the people before Moses and said, let us go up to this country and occupy it. Right? He quieted all the naysayers. All the people said, oh, we can't go up there because all this stuff's happening. We can't do this. I want to share a story real quick. I know when I, uh, I did an island party, a sober party, it took over an island in the Susquehanna River. And we had music, we had concerts, we had 200 people there. It was on the news. And to get, the way to get to this island, I had a, a John boat and, you know, we had a rope. And basically going from the, the shore to the island, you know, you can use the rope and just get It's probably like a 30-foot voyage to the island. It wasn't too intense. The water's probably four feet deep. And the first three people, we had a line of probably 50 people ready to go to the island. And the first three people that were on the boat, I don't know what they did, but they like were like moving too much and, and the boat flipped over and they all went in the water and got in four feet worth of water. You know, like it wasn't that deep. And uh, that struck fear in everybody that was in line. Like, I don't know if we can go to the island now. I don't know if we can do it. And, and I just had to stand up and, and just like I felt this like sudden rush of fear like, Nobody wanted to go to the island anymore. They're waiting in line to get on the island. And now all of a sudden they see one boat tip over because some guys didn't know how to steady a rope to get across to the island. And then the fear struck a cord and everybody waiting in line. And they're like, I don't know if it's safe. And I had to like stand up in front of them like, it's safe. Like it's safe. Like you're, you're going to miss out on going to this island because of Somebody fell into the water, right? And, and, and they got right back up and they got to the island. Nobody drowned. I was like, it's a beautiful thing. Like, and the, the island party was incredible. It was a historic moment. And they would have missed out on that promised land because of fear of some disgruntled, of some fearful, I don't know if we can get across to the island. Just spread through the whole line. And I had to stand up and say, it's safe. Like, don't be afraid. Hold on to the rope. Right? And everybody got across. There's no more instances. I swear the enemy used this one person to kind of rock the boat too much where the water got in and it flipped. And all that fear just went through the whole thing. But I stood up and said, hey. Do not let that fear rob you from the things that God wants to bring you to. And there's so many people that came to that island that got set free from drugs and alcohol. They got saved. That experienced the presence of God. Right? On an island in the Susquehanna River. They didn't allow the fear to prevent them from going over. So Caleb gets up there and he, he said, Quiet, so he told them to shut up. <laughs> like, Stop this negative. We can't take the land. He just, he went up there and told them to shut their mouth. Right? Like, be quiet. Like, have you missed out on all the incredible things God has done in our life leading up to this point? God is not going to forsake you. 
Verse 31, the man who had gone up with them and said, We are not able to go against the people, for they are stronger than we are. Right? This negative, oh, we're defeated. Oh, it's so bad. I don't know if God can use us. They're stronger than us. You ever feel like you're too weak? That the, the, the challenge is too hard? So then they brought the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying the land... Right now they're going to talk about the land. Like it used to be this beautiful land flowing with milk and honey, with these incredible grapes. Now it's like the land which we have gone to spy out. The land devours its inhabitants. Right? This is dangerous land. You know, they probably had like those, uh, what is it, the Venus fly traps, you know? It's like the, the land just devouring its inhabitants. It's so dangerous now, we can't go over there. You know, the land is so bad. And all the people saw it in its great height. And then they saw not only this, this dangerous land, they saw the Nephilim, the sons of the Anak, who came out from the Nephilim. These are giants. Like, not only do they have a strong armies, they have giants. Like, surely we can't take it now. They said to the, the they said we seem like grasshoppers to ourselves. That's how small a view they saw themselves as little grasshoppers. And a lot of times the challenges we're facing in life, we feel small. We say, I don't know if we can do this. Right? I don't know if we can get through this. And we view ourselves like grasshoppers. And that's the small defeated view. The small defeated view is what these ten spies said. They came back with that negative defeated view after surveying the promised land. They are stronger than us. The land devours its inhabitants, thus large fortified cities were outnumbered by all the ites. Right? They have so many different heights for these different tribes of people. Like, we can't go in there. We're outnumbered. And I ask you this. What is preventing you today from taking ground here in green? Like, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We're empowered by God. What is preventing you from making disciples in green? Maybe it's just the culture's atheists. They're agnostic. They don't, maybe they're part of other religions. People don't believe in God anymore, so I'm not going to try to tell them about Jesus. Maybe they're just too far gone, too out of reach. The city's hardened. Their hearts are hardened towards God. The needs are too great. Maybe you've tried to reach out to people, but then just the needs just overwhelm you. And they start asking for things every day and calling you all night. And the needs just become so overwhelming. It becomes too great to handle sometimes. But what is preventing us from taking ground here in green? I want to finish this out with this thought here. Your unbelief will prevent you from stepping into God's promised land for your life. Our view of the circumstance, we feel like grasshoppers, and, and the, the challenges are too great, and our disbelief in God is going to rob you from stepping into what you have that he has for you. In Hebrews 3, 14 through 17, for we have come to share in Christ, and if indeed we hold on to our original confidence firm to the end. Verse 15, it says, and as, as it is said, today you'll hear his voice. 
Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. This is in the New Testament reflecting on the Old Testament of this time through walking through the desert, the rebellion. God freed them from slavery and now they have, they're free and they're choosing to rebel and disbelieve God. After the many miracles, after the many times, Christ has showed himself faithful. Verse 16, for those who have heard yet rebelled, not all those who left Egypt led by Moses. Sorry, was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? Question mark, right? Yes, Moses led them out. Verse 17, that those who were provoked for 40 years, was it not those who sinned and their bodies fell in the wilderness? Verse 18, and to those whom he swear did not enter his rest, but those who were disobedient. So we see they were unable to enter because of their unbelief. It's powerful. Our unbelief is going to prevent us from stepping into it. And I think in all hindsight of the whole Exodus story and many scriptures in the Old Testament, it shows us that the view of heaven is a perfect, sinless place. In order to get there, you have to be sinless, holy, like, if you think about it, if you die and you go to heaven and somebody robs you of your gold chain and takes your purse, or you get up there and somebody starts a fight with you and, and slaps you in the face as soon as you get up there, you'd be like, this, what, this, this is heaven? You'd be very disappointed if you got to heaven and you seen Hitler up there and, and you seen him like, hey, come on over to my house. Right? You'd be disappointed. Like, this is not sinless. This is not a perfect place. It'd be a letdown. If you, if you went up to heaven and seen the sinful nature and sin running rampant in the golden streets. One of the things that I want to show you in the Old Testament compared to the New Testament, the Old Covenant to the New Covenant, the Old Covenant the people failed their end of the bargain because we're sinners. Moses, an outstanding like leader on all levels, struck a rock in anger and sinned and disobeyed God and he wasn't able to enter the promised land. That's pretty intense. You think like, man, God's standards are so strong, but I'm telling you, you don't want to go to heaven someday and see... Somebody lash out on anger on you, right? So what? So Jesus had to live a sinless, perfect life that none of us could live. He he fulfilled all of the commandments of the law, right? He 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 lived the perfect, sinless life, and when we come to Christ, He can forgive us of all our sin and changes us. Power of the Holy Spirit gives us power to change. And now we can stand before a holy God, and not because of our righteousness or our holiness, but because of Christ's holiness. It's like putting on a, 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 a light coat that you're full of light, and you get to stand in the light and be in the same presence together. <clears throat> so the Israelites were unable to enter into this promised land because of unbelief. And I'll tell you what, the thing that's going to prevent us from going to heaven is unbelief and rejecting Christ and rejecting the free will and the free gift that he has given to us. But not only to heaven, we're going to miss out on the free, uh, on the promised land that he has for us even here on earth. He has something beautiful for every single person here. Something great. He's got a mission for all of us. And we're going to be, we're going to miss out on that by our disobedience to God. We we'll say, oh, I can't do that. I can't go out there. I can't be used. 
And we allow this negative, defeated, discouraged view, and we, we, we totally neglect the great things that God has for us. But I ask you today, is there any Joshua's, is there any Caleb's in the house that says, hey, we can take the land. I know it looks difficult. I know it looks like very challenging. I, like we're like grasshoppers going out there. But is there anybody in the house today that says we can take green? We can reach the city. We can reach one person. You can reach one person. You can reach two people. But even if you just focus on reaching one person, say, I'm going to make one disciple. I want to lead one person to Jesus. I want to impact one person's life. You never know that one person might become the next Billy Graham. That one person will get developed. And when you, when you take them under your wing and say, hey, here's an opportunity to sing. Here's an opportunity to preach. You guys have opportunity here to preach. There's preachers in this house. There's people that can sing in this house. There's people in this house that can make a difference in kids' ministry. You have opportunity to step out into the gifts and talents God has put inside you. Now come all the way from Corning, New York to say God believes in you. God has empowered you by his Holy Spirit. Now let's step up and, and, and go out to the land and say, you know what, we can take this land. Because God is for us. It doesn't matter who's against us. Because he is for us. I want to close this out. First one is the salvation invitation. You don't want to miss out on heaven because of your disobedience. You don't want to go through your life and say, I'm going to disobey God. I'm going to disobey following him. He's got a promised land for you. Right now he's preparing a way. He's preparing mansions in heaven. He's, he's preparing a better place for us. And if he did this whole world in six days and he rested on the seventh, and right now he's preparing a place for us, how much greater is this new heaven and the new earth, man? Right? If he's spending all this time, six days, this is incredible. Like I drive up on top of mountains. I see these, these beautiful views. I see the trees and the valleys and the mountains. I'm like, God, this is beautiful. Declares your handiwork when you spoke this whole world into existence. But now you're creating something new. New heavens, new earth. Streets of gold. Right? Our minds can't even fathom how beautiful heaven's going to be like. But one of the things I, I, I can imagine is, is experiencing His Holy Spirit on earth here, just spending a few seconds in the presence of God, just that little touch from the Holy Spirit. I think that's just a little down payment, that little glimpse of what he's going to do for all of eternity. Amen? So the first prayer I want to pray is a salvation invitation. To say, I want to follow Jesus. I want to obey him. I want to pursue him. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you today, say, I want to follow Jesus today. Slip up your hand. Let's pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I come to you today just as I am. I've sinned. I've made mistakes. I've been disobedient. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to change me by the power of your Holy Spirit. Use me to make a difference in this world. And from this moment forward, I want to pursue you with all that I am. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand up. I want to I wanna pray for us for the baptism of the Holy Spirit.
And also, if you've already been filled, uh, a rebaptism, a refilling. So it'd be cool if you guys want to just fill in this area. I'll come down and pray for you. But before we do that, I want to just say a closing prayer. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Lord, in closing, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the men and women that are in this place. That they're fighting for their church. They're fighting for uh, the next season of this church. That you're going to do great things in green. And we just come against all of the disgruntled views. The defeated views. The, oh, it's too hard to, to make a difference. Like, just that defeated negative thought pattern. We just come against that right now in Jesus' name. We're going to be like Caleb and say, be quiet. We can take this land. We are victorious. If God is for me, who can be against me? So God, we're going to stand up. We're going to rise up and we're going to take ground. We're going to take territory. We're not going to do it in our own strength. We're going to be filled with your Holy Spirit. We're going to move in power. But Lord God, I thank you for the two people that had an optimistic view of what you were going to do, God. There was 10 people that said it's defeated, it's dying, it's not going to work, we're, we're walking into a death trap, there's no good outlook. But there was two people that were trained, that were discipled by Moses, that were raised up in faith, and they seen Moses going up to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. These two disciples of Moses got to see Moses do all these different plagues by the power of God. They, they got to see Moses go to the Red Sea and, and see the, the sea splits. They've seen God move in miraculous ways in their mentor. And now Josh, Joshua and Caleb said, we can take the land. We've seen what God did in our predecessor's life. And there's people in this room today that God has used mightily in this house. He's done miracles in your life and there's people watching you. They're watching your faith. They're watching what God can do through you. And God, we just pray that you raise up some, some Joshua's and Caleb's in this place. People that were mentored. People that were discipled. People that could see the faith on your life. That we can take this land. We can take green. We can take Broome County. We can take New York State. We can take America back by the power of your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you raise up the faith in this house that nothing's impossible. That you are a faithful God. You are a powerful God. You're a miracle-working God in this place. We believe in you. Our help comes from the Lord. So God, we just, we just ask you to fill people up today. Baptize them with your Holy Spirit and with fire. Burn in them, Lord God. And fire can't stay in one place. It has to spread out. It has to take ground. It has to take over households and cities and neighborhoods. God, I pray that you set a fire in our hearts today, Lord God. Fill us to overflowing, baptize us with your Holy Spirit and with fire, God, to make a difference in this area. In Jesus' name, amen. If anybody wants to come up here, I want to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the prayer I want to pray for everybody. If you haven't, been, if you haven't received it yet, I want to pray for you that you receive it. And if you've already been filled, or are refilling. Amen, let's do this. Mister.